Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest living here in Austin, Texas, and uh, have had the gift of recovery since December 27th of 1972. And these podcasts uh, are my attempt to try to go deeper into the nature of addiction and explore some of the practices of the pioneers that they used uh, in early recovery. Uh, and a big part of that uh, revolved around two-way prayer. So if you haven't done so already, I'd encourage you to go and visit our website. It's called Two-Way Prayer. And uh, sign up there for the newsletter. Try to get that out about once a month, every six weeks. And encourage you also to attend a workshop. Uh, we did one uh, last Sunday uh, on the 12 steps and kind of the historical background to them. Uh, I think it was a pretty good response to that uh, first time, um, but we'll, we'll do more of those uh, during this year and next. And the next two-way prayer workshop is going to be on October the 9th uh, from 10 to 1230 Central Time. So if you would, drop me a line at uh, twowayprayer at gmail, and I'll send you a flyer uh, for that one. And finally, I do want to thank our donors who uh, keep this little operation afloat. Uh, and uh, we, we give everything away here. Uh, nobody's making any money off of this stuff. That's a, that's a bottom line must. Uh, but we do have expenses. So if you're able to help us meet those, it would be very much appreciated. You can go to the website and there's a donate button there. This series that we're doing now is centered on the book, The War of the Gods in Addiction. And it's, uh, it going, it's going deep into the correspondence between Bill Wilson and Carl Jung uh, back in 1960. Um, and in it, uh, Jung expressed some of his deepest beliefs about uh, his treatment of Roland Hazard, what was going on there. And uh, he ventured to explain to Bill, he risked, I guess would be a better way to put it, he risked telling him what he really thought was uh, at the depth of the illness that uh, Roland Hazard was experiencing. And it uh, gets really deep into the spirituality of the program. Uh, and, and so it's, uh, it, it, it kind of takes us deeper and deeper into that. I, I think it's an excellent book. And uh, we are now up to chapter three. This is probably the most difficult chapter in the whole book because it's here that the author tries to tackle the question of evil as, uh, as Jung saw it. What's the evil that is present in addiction and, and how do you treat it? Uh, Jung said that he, he dared not explain to Roland what he believed was underlying his addiction. And the truth is most therapists and even most clergy avoid uh, venturing into this area this area of, of really deep evil, and probably for the same reason. Uh, it's so very easy to, to be misunderstood. Uh, so we're asking the question, what is the nature of the evil that we are dealing with uh, in addiction to alcohol and to any number of other addictions as well? So this section is definitely the most challenging chapter in his book, and, and I am happy to report that the author, uh, David Cheyenne, has agreed to... Uh, uh, join us for an interview in a couple of weeks, and hopefully he'll help us understand this concept uh, better than I'm going to be able to interpret his remarks, uh, particularly in this episode. But anyway, in a nutshell, what I think Cheyenne is saying is this, that there is truly a spiritual war raging inside every real alcoholic. And that's not just a metaphor but a genuine fact that the spiritual world is real. Uh, it's the, it's the, the psyche, the soul, and that's where this battle is happening. So throwing caution to the wind, uh, just like uh, Jung finally did in his letter to Wilson, uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Now, the author begins with a brief overview of evil uh, in religions throughout history. And I'll go through this one quickly. But in Egyptian myth, it's found in Set, the brother of Osiris. He's described as the bringer of darkness and drought. From him comes everything destructive and opposed to human life. 
In Norse mythology, the evil is located in Loki, a, a real trickster and a deceiver. Uh, <laughs> study him and, and you get to see the cunning, baffling, powerful element in addiction. That's what certainly sprang to my mind. Shayan writes, uh, gradually through his double dealing, Loki uh, prepares for the day when the enemies of life will be unleashed and then he will take the field at their head. For Loki, evil is not a vehicle or a means to an end. Evil is an end in itself. In Persian myth, Ariman uh, signifies, quote, death, darkness, lies, and the, Ill, the ills of mankind. He's locked in war with the good god, Ahura Mazda. Uh, and we're all hoping uh, Mazda wins that one. So, uh, and, and then, of course, in the Judeo-Christian myth, the evil starts out as Lucifer, an angel of light, but he rebels against God. And then he engages in an ongoing battle with Christ. In Christianity, Christ is, is seen as the son of God. But there's also a concept of an antichrist. Uh, maybe he's the other son. And, and Jung actually gets into this in, in his answer to Job and Ion and some of his later works. It's very controversial. Um, and maybe I'll have the guts to dig into that someday. But he's the lost son. You can think of him as the, the left hand of God. That something's going on in God's consciousness. And, and, it, and it relates directly to his relationship with human consciousness. So Shane points out uh, to, to the nature of the real uh, divine warfare going on in each one of these myths. And he says in the, in the Judeo-Christian myth, uh, the one that most reflects the Western psyche, according to Jung, that evil comes to us in two forms, the divine or archetypal evil that comes into the world through Lucifer as he opposes God and and sets up an alternative kingdom, and the evil that comes through Adam and Eve's free will decision not to follow God's will and plan for the world. In the Western myth, uh, we get a double dose of this of this evil. And, and Shane points out that in both forms uh, of this evil, both human and divine, uh, enter the world through acts of free will. Uh, by Adam and Eve and by the angels. How? In exercising their right to freely choose to either serve God or serve themselves. And that kind of takes us down to, uh, you know, kind of that third step choice that, that we have to make. Uh, and I don't think we, uh, we have any idea when we make it. You know, we, we say that we're selfish, self-centered and all that good stuff. I don't think we have any idea of how deeply true that is, that we are, we are uh, clinging to godlike qualities still in ourselves. But recovery is, is the journey of, of overcoming those, of letting go of those, and giving back to God the things that are God's. And um, so, I mean, we say God is everything or is nothing. And, and what is our choice to be. So we have to make a choice. Uh, at first, it's a choice of not drinking, not drugging. It's, it's that initial choice. But I'm here to tell you, after 48 years in this program, that choice is going to deepen as time goes on. And if you're growing in recovery, you get to see the ego at play more and more uh, as it surrenders more and more. And that is really, I think, what life is about is uh, is learning how to surrender, learning how to let go. And uh, for us, it starts with alcohol. But if, if it ends there, uh, then we have really not done the journey. Now, these religious stories, uh, most people um, uh, tend to scoff at them. And we say they're, they're just stories, that, that science disproves them. Uh, but what Jung and Cheyenne uh, and most Jungians are saying is look to our stories and look to our myths, look to them because they hold truths that are not literal truths, but truths that are bigger than literal. They're symbolic truths. 
uh, that speak to something going on inside each and every one of us. That's how they get to be stories of this kind and truths of this kind. They're representing something really deep, but hard to get a handle on. Uh, something that's true, but impossible really to put into words or to reproduce in a laboratory. Uh, Jung believed in the world of the spirit, and so does Shane. And so, thank God, uh, did the authors of the big book, you know. That's why they're laying out a spiritual path for us to take. And today, uh, most modern minds, um, for most modern minds, psychology and philosophy, they try to pick up where most of our religions left off. And um, I think we got about a 500 year period now that we're entering into uh, where, where, uh, where we're going to re reinterpret our, our myths, our stories. And, uh, you know, the appreciation of what's happening in the unconscious, it's only about 100 years old. It's not very old. And our understanding of alcoholism is, is even less than that. But I think both of these are going to play a huge role in how we come to understand our religious myths. And, and I can see it happening uh, right now. So psychology, um, psychology itself means the study of the soul. And, and like every one of us, uh, it too wants to know, what is the nature of this evil, the evil that we see in ourselves, that we see in others, and, and maybe most especially the evil that we see in huge cases. Sometimes you study those and you get to see... Uh, uh, clarity because they're so huge, it's it's hard to miss. Uh, how do we explain an Adolf Hitler or a Stalin or a mass murderer? You know, is it really explainable by just lousy parenting? Or did something much darker, something much more sinister take hold of them and then they enter into a relationship with that? Is real evil alive and at work in the world? Are people possessed by something? some destructive power that's at work and is far greater than their ability to, to withstand it. And this is what Shane, uh, what leads him rather, uh, to look very deeply into the nature of addiction. And so that's what we're going to join him in doing today. And uh, he takes Jung's words written to Bill Wilson seriously that there was genuine, genuine spiritual warfare going on inside his patient, Roland Hazard. And it was the thing he saw uh, in most of the real alcoholics that he worked with. And Jung thought it was a war being waged truly for Roland's own soul, an enemy, capital E, <clears throat> that would overwhelm him if he did not come to find a transforming spiritual experience in his life. And that's, of course, what sent him to the Oxford group. And that's what uh, early AA was all about, trying to reproduce that spiritual experience within people uh, to help us or them overcome addiction. And, uh, and that's exactly what Jung and the big book tell us, that left to ourselves, fighting addiction by ourselves, that without spiritual help and without the fellowship uh, of our fellow men and women and, and without growing up spiritually, uh, we're, we're going to have a really difficult time with this thing. Uh, my experience is, you know, you may, you may not drink, but um, watch for another addiction to come in and take its place and, uh, and ruin your life uh, just as quickly or as the other would. The poet Maya Angelou asks, <clears throat> do good and evil exist as powers in some dimension which we cannot imagine? Shane quotes uh, some pretty good say, psychological definitions of evil. Uh, he quotes uh, Scott Peck who says, evil is the act which arbitrarily disturbs the natural relationship between the two realms of God and man and permanently conjures up the realm of death for a mortal being. And he also references Sigmund Freud, uh, who wrote a, a book titled Eros and Thanatos. And Eros is the life force, and Thanatos is the death wish. 
and, and, and uh, he says that there's a death wish unrealized, but still at work deep inside the human unconscious. Talk about wars going on. Shane notes that studies show 90% of people uh, have had suicidal thoughts at some time during their life. And I'd be willing to bet for us alco alcoholics and addicts, it's a heck of a lot closer to 100%. Uh, I know I did. Because um, life gets very painful. And is this all there is? Um, Victor Frankl, uh, we should do a series on him. Uh, his, his point was that if, that if you don't find meaning and purpose in your life, um, you're not going to make it. And I think that that's what recovery is about. It's not about not drinking. It's about finding that meaning and that purpose uh, deep within, within our own lives. Now, Sean makes a, a, a very difficult point. Well, he, he said, addiction is intent on killing us. And that is his core concept. He says, if it's not something that's out to kill us, then it's not a real addiction. So he says, we need to be very careful what we label as addiction. Because if, uh, if, if we see everything as an addiction, then nothing is an addiction. That's why I take great exception when people say, oh, I'm powerless over people, places, and things. I'm powerless over alcohol. And I damn well had better remember that and put that first in my life. I'm not powerless over Albuquerque. I'm not powerless over Alice. I'm powerless over alcohol. And what does that mean? And what are the implications of that? I mean, that's basic first step stuff for me. Shane writes, the great existential question of life and death, to be or not to be, seems to be hard, a hardwired part of human beings. The idea of a universal death wish seems strange at first glance until we reflect on it as a phenomenon, as something that's, that we see in, in action. People with addictions struggle every day against the irrational, illogical actuality that they continue to destroy themselves in spite of all the information, education, and reasonable, logical, rational arguments otherwise. Hey, this one won't kill me, and off I go. You know, those of us in recovery, we, we get to witness this war going on. We get to witness it uh, both in ourselves and in other people. Um, and I remember in, in early sobriety, I had a friend, his name was George, and uh, George and I got sober together. And uh, But the evil or the murderous madness, or call it what you will, uh, that is addiction, it started re-entering and taking control of his mind. I saw it as it started. Uh, he was beginning to drop out. He was starting to slide on his program. Other things were becoming more important to him than his recovery. Women, uh, work, money, you know, all the usual suspects showed up. And then one day, George said to me, that this is I swear it's true. He said, well, I'm going to go out and have some drinks, but I'll be back. I'm going to come back. I watched him. Uh, he did go out, but he couldn't get back. He'd get back for a week or he'd get back for a month, but then he'd go out again. And in the end, uh, George never made it back. In the end, addiction took another victim. The evil that overtook his mind then took his life. So, so what is this evil? You know, uh, I, I think the myths uh, are, are uh, uh, I pay a lot of attention to the, uh, the Star Wars. Uh, I think that that'll, <laughs> that myth, uh, and George Lucas based that on, on religious myths uh, throughout history. That, that, and he was talking about this evil, this dark force. Does one go over to the dark side of the force or to the light side of the force? And... Uh, and you better feel your way and you better know your way. Otherwise, you're going to get destroyed. So, so what is this evil that, that makes addiction unlike other forms of mental illness and requires such a different and such a radical form of treatment? Treatment that Jung says has to be grounded in a spiritual transformation. Shane writes that in addiction, there is something darker and more sinister 
than our traditional views of mental illness, as sad, tragic, and debilitating as schizophrenia and bipolar disorders can be, there's still a sense of hopeful humanness that underlies them. And they can be and are impacted in a positive way, sometimes significantly, by different forms of psychotherapy or psychopharmacology. In depression, obsessive compulsive disorders, bipolar disorders, schizophrenic disorders, personality disorders, and adjustment disorders, there is no absolute initial treatment requirement for its effectiveness that there be an ego collapse conversion experience, that a person admit complete powerlessness, and that they turn to a higher power or authority in the psyche to heal them. In fact, in all these other mental emotional disorders, it is often necessary, helpful, and even required that the existing ego complex system be strengthened, deepened, expanded, and more greatly empowered to do its job effectively. Traditional psychotherapy can be very effective in helping the patient to do this. So Shane is saying that addiction is different and the treatment of addiction therefore needs to be very different as well. As we say in the program, uh, our illness is physical, our illness is mental, but the solution to this illness has got to be spiritual. Shane looks at this difference in, in how we approach our addiction, uh, what it does for us, what it promises, and what it actually delivers for us. Uh, I mean, I don't think you don't get addicted to something that uh, doesn't feel good. In some way, it feels good. And in, in some ways, for the real addict, it feels great. And this is the enticement of the evil that's at work, but unrecognized. And uh, in explaining this, he quotes from Robert Thomason's biography of Bill Wilson and, and Bill's first encounter with getting drunk. I think it's a beautiful description of the allure that our addictions carry with them, how they call to us, you know? Uh, so listen to Bill getting hooked. He's 21, he's in the army, and he's at a party. He's nervous. Uh, always had been unsure of himself. And then he takes that magical first drink. Thomason writes, perhaps it took a little time, but it seemed to happen instantly. He could feel his body relaxing, the stiffness going out of his shoulders as he sensed the warm glow seeping through him into all the distant forgotten corners of his being. Soon he had the feeling that he wasn't the one being introduced, but that people were being introduced to him. He wasn't joining groups. Groups were forming around him. It was unbelievable. And at the sudden realization of how quickly the world could change, he had to laugh and he couldn't stop laughing. It was a miracle. There were no other words. A miracle that was affecting him mentally, physically, and as he would soon learn spiritually too. Still smiling, he looked at people around him. They were not superior beings. They were friends. They liked him, and he liked them. When he left, he was in a state of overwhelming joy. His world was all around him, young and fresh and loving. As he made his way down the drive, he moved easily, gracefully, as though he knew exactly how he felt. All his life, he had been living in chains. Now he was free. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's an addict out there listening who can't relate to that. How many of us remember our first drink or drug and where it took us? Hey, there's a deeply devilish allure that comes to us in our addictions. They promise us joy, excitement, relief. And in the beginning, they deliver. But after time, in the end, when the devil comes to get his due, as Jung might say, eh, when the pain replaces all the joy, uh, then what do they promise us? They promise us not to feel at all. You don't have to feel anything. And towards the end of our drinking and drugging, most of us don't drink for fun, fun and excitement. We drink to not feel. And it, and it delivers. Me at war against my addiction, bet on my addiction. Because by ourselves, relying on our own power, the addictions are going to have their way and lead us one step closer to death. 
Shayan uh, doesn't mention this in his book, but the story of Jesus and his, and his temptations in the wilderness uh, came to mind when I was reading this part of his book. And, and, and Jesus uh, in the story had just been baptized and, and it says immediately he's led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Um, you gotta be prepared. I mean, temptations are going to come. Excuse me, they are part of, of, of being human. To be tempted uh, is, is part of life. And so after, after 40 long days and nights in the wilderness, the tempter shows up. Jesus is tempted three times, and he's offered all the things that, that the devil can offer. What? Money, power, control. But the important lesson of this story isn't that Jesus overcomes the temptations and does it by himself. It's how he does it, see? Jesus quotes scripture in every case back to the devil. He doesn't rely on himself. He doesn't rely on his own power. He relies on the power of God. He relies on the word of God. He's humble enough and wise enough to know that by himself, human as he was, he could not. But with God, he could. You know, and that's the lesson. That was his lesson that he learned and our lesson that we have to learn. Shane says, uh, the evil that we meet in addiction isn't something we can overcome or control or ever integrate into our personalities. He says, it's kind of like meeting a vampire that wants to kill us. You don't sit down and reason with a vampire. You get out the garlic and the crucifix uh, and you run like hell. And that, that's, <laughs> you know, what, what does the big book say? Uh, when temptation comes, we recoil as from a hot flame. Um, there's a lot more in this chapter, uh, but I want to close with a really important point that the author makes, and, and that's the, the permanent mark that addiction leaves on our souls, that once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Uh, there is no going back. And here Shane uh, looks at other spiritual marks, specifically the sacraments that, that are part of the Christian tradition, and, and he compares them to the mark left on the soul of an addict. Here's what he says. Once you have crossed that line, there is no going back. There is always the latent potential for reactivation of the addiction. It is something like the reverse of the belief that a positive indelible character or mark is conferred at Christian baptism, which claims, initiates, and activates a person as a Christian. From that point on, for the rest of one's life, regardless of whether the person practices the Christian faith or not. Christian confirmation as a sacrament is also believed to, to activate the Holy Spirit in a special way that is a permanent potential for spiritual growth, regardless of whether the person uses it or not. So is the awakening of the Kundalini in the Hindu tradition, which is believed to permanently awaken and activate the spiritual, psychological, and physical energies of potential transformation in the individual. Now, then he asks, if the highest spiritual forces of goodness and grace can leave these kinds of permanent effects, it seems logical to suppose that the most powerful forces of destruction and evil can in some way do likewise in the opposite direction. He finishes up saying, this exposure and proximity to such powerful, lethal, and unintegratable, dark, destructive energies leave a perpetual marker, scar, and vulnerability, like being exposed to super powerful, deadly, psychological nuclear radiation which leaves an internal residue in the cells of the body and of the psyche. Any further exposure to the radiation could reactivate the lethal toxicities and result again in sickness and even death. Once exposed, there is always the potential danger of reactivation with any further exposure. Once an addict, uh, always an addict. You know, what we say, there is no cure, but what we do have is a daily reprieve 
based upon our spiritual condition. Now, I know uh, Dr. Bob said, keep it simple. And uh, I also know from the history that he warned Bill not to louse this program up with a lot of Freudian stuff. But uh, Bob did not say anything about lousing it up with Jungian stuff. <laughs> and I think the two uh, are, are somewhat different. Uh, I think Jung understood addiction uh, in far, far deeper ways than Freud ever did. And, uh, and different, I think, from uh, what most psychologists uh, um, think of it, uh, what's taught at most treatment centers. Uh, I just think we're missing the deeper levels of transformation that have to happen uh, in recovery um, at, at the deepest, deepest levels of the psyche. And that's, that's what Jung uh, got down to. That's the journey that he sent Roland out to find. Uh, and that's what the Oxford group uh, offered. I'm not saying uh, you know, we should all become little Oxford group uh, disciples. I, I don't believe that. But I believe we can look to the principles and the practices that were going on in that group and were going on in early AA because they had recovery numbers uh, that were far, far greater than what we're seeing today, and they were based upon spiritual transformations. Okay, so uh, enough for now. Uh, we will pick up uh, next week uh, when Shane begins looking at the 12 steps, and, and he asks, uh, why is it that they are able to overcome evil? What is it in this spiritual journey that uh, keeps the evil present in addiction, uh, at least at bay. So uh, I know this was heavy stuff. I, I thank you for staying with me on it. Uh, I, I hope some of it was helpful, and I will look forward to seeing you next time. So God bless, and I hope you'll keep coming back.